The Cornhill Magazine is one of the most prominent English periodicals of the later 19th century. Specializing in serial publications and criticism, the Cornhill rose rapidly and found the most success in its first numbers. Circulation steadily diminished, however, and the Cornhill struggled to find stability. Numerous editors unsuccessfully tried to alter the magazine's approach. There was constant tension between the magazine's ideals and popular desires, and many editors struggled to accommodate public interests while upholding the magazine's values. George Murray Smith, a publisher, founded the magazine in 1859, and the first number appeared in January 1860. The publication was issued as a competitor to Charles Dickens's All the Year Round, which was one of the most prominent literary journals at this time. Hiring William Makepeace Thackeray as editor was perhaps the most overt reflection of this competition, since Thackeray was Dickens's chief literary rival. As Fisher explains, Smith depended upon Thackeray's reputation to buttress the publication's initial numbers. Thackeray's reputation as a gentleman and his high prose style helped to establish the Cornhill's reputation as an elite magazine. Thackeray's inclusion established the magazine's tone and solidified which values the magazine would foster. Maunder explains that the initial numbers of the Cornhill accommodated the growing Victorian reading public, provoking anxiety among elite readers about literacy, culture, social divisions, and social class. Rather than catering to only the literary elite, the Cornhill, led by Thackeray's vision, targeted a middle-class audience and reinforced their values and patriarchal norms. Whereas all the year round balanced literature and popular fiction, the Cornhill tried to appeal to a wider audience than its counterpart. Although the tactic worked initially, the magazine quickly lost its flair and became defined more as a popular magazine. This label was not always beneficial. On one hand, the magazine was inclusive and appealed to a large group. On the other hand, the magazine struggled to keep up with the popular demands of its target audience. Maintaining its values and its aesthetics was challenging as the magazine tried to maintain its popularity. As the magazine developed between 1860 and 1868, this delicate balance is at the forefront of any discussion about the Cornhill. The Cornhill roared to life initially. With Thackeray as its editor, the magazine sold 110,000 copies of its first number. This success is astounding by any standard of judging inaugural numbers. Even subsequent numbers achieved excellent circulation numbers, averaging between 80,000 and 120,000 numbers sold. The magazine's low price was a primary reason for this success. The low cost and the literary value combined to create an attractive product for many readers. The cost-size ratio is among the best of all magazines available at this time. Receiving over 100 pages of literature for a shilling was astounding value. Even competitors and counterparts recognized this incredible value. As Dawson explains, both the Illustrated Times and Notes and Queries commented that the Cornhill offered unprecedented cheapness and affordability for a magazine of its size. People bought into the publication, and for the first two years, Cornhill experienced success that nobody could have anticipated. Featuring prominent writers such as Charlotte Bronte, George Eliot, Lord Tennyson, and Charles Lever, the Cornhill supplied a steady dose of strong literary content for its readers, and it became a primary place to publish fiction. It is notable that, during this time, the Cornhill remained a close competitor for all the year round, which published 120,000 copies per issue in 1860. However, the success was short-lived. Thackeray's interest waned, and he eventually left the publication in 1862. Colby explains that the continuing gastric problems and declining circulation numbers impacted Thackeray's decision to leave the editorial post. Thackeray's connection with the magazine did not end completely, however, and he continued to write in its pages until his death in 1863. Over the next few years, the Cornhill struggled to find its way somewhat. Able editors took over the publication, but the same struggles remained. Not wanting to sacrifice its literary aesthetic, the magazine's administration avoided sentimental fiction as long as possible, even though it was popular among the magazine's target audience, the middle class. Smith in particular wanted to uphold the paper's integrity, but eventually recognized that saving the Cornhill as a publication meant that he would have to sacrifice some of its founding principles to reach its readership. Change slowly happened over the next six years under Frederick Greenwood's editorship. Greenwood, who would later join Smith when the Pall Mall Gazette was issued, Greenwood edited the magazine, started to transform the Cornhill's contents, but circulation continued to plummet. By 1868, the Cornhill attracted between 18 and 21,000 readers per number. While this figure was still respectable, 
It was far from the 100,000 that the inaugural numbers attracted, and it was far from the figures posted by other prominent publications, such as All the Year Round, which sold 300,000 copies per issue, The Times, which circulated between 65 and 100,000 copies per number, and Punch, which sold about 40,000 copies per issue around this time. These low circulation numbers and the Cornhill's rapidly declining popularity certainly make its prominence questionable. The Victorian Web calls it, quote, the most important magazine of the latter part of the 19th century, end quote. But the paper's downward trend tells a different story. Was the paper important? Yes. Intriguing? Certainly. Most prominent? Not by a lot. During these more trying years, the paper continued to attract prominent writers, but even their interest waned. Elizabeth Baird Browning, Robert Browning, Elliot, Matthew Arnold, Elizabeth Gaskell, and Wilkie Collins, who was pried away from all the year round for £500 per annum, all contributed to the Cornhill during this time. Yet the readership did not increase. Collins struggled to meet deadlines. Arnold, whose culture and anarchy was published in 1867-1868, eventually stopped publishing in the Cornhill because of concerns about the magazine's direction and confusion about its intended audience. Signs of discord between writers, editors, and general public, however, predate Greenwood's editorship and even the Cornhill's decline. John Ruskin's Unto This Last, which is now considered a prominent work of political economy, was cancelled after four months because popular opinion could no longer be ignored. This strife occurred during Thackeray's administration, and according to the Victorian Web and the preface to Unto This Last, it seems that he hesitated to cease the essay's publication. Eventually, however, public interest won. The Cornhill's rapid decline is still as intriguing to modern scholars as it was troubling to the magazine's administration. Over the next two decades, the magazine seems to have been chasing its former glory. Subsequent editors, including Greenwood, Leslie Stephen, and James Payne, all tried to restore the magazine's literary prominence, but this did not translate into higher circulation figures. Or maybe this is the way that the magazine's history has been interpreted and transcribed. Regardless, the magazine cannot be considered a failure because it was unable to maintain unrealistic sales. It persisted for another hundred years and still attracted some of the most prominent English writers. Leslie Stephen was perhaps one redeeming feature of the Cornhill responsible for the paper's brief literary renaissance. When Stephen took over the publication in 1871, he was able to stabilize the magazine's literary interests. Under his guidance, Thomas Hardy, Margaret Oliphant, Henry James, and Robert Louis Stevenson were all published with some regularity. This stability does not mean that the Cornhill rebounded to its former previous popularity levels. By 1882, its circulation had settled around 12,000 per copy. This is still respectable, but certainly not in line with the top circulating papers of the day. Thackeray's departure, according to Horn, removed the magazine's star presence. Thackeray's influence on the readership could never be recaptured, even in the most prominent years under Stevens or James Payne's guidance. Eventually, the Cornhill settled into an existence as a regular literary magazine, and it lasted until 1975. There were several twists and turns along this path, far too many to recount here. It was influenced by the World Wars, it tried various formats, and it endured numerous hardships. Yet the publication persisted as a literary magazine, which sold a respectable 10 to 12,000 copies per issue into the 1950s. Edward Cook in 1909 called it the spirit of humane culture, according to R.C. Terry, and who are we to argue with such a distinction? Perhaps the magazine's popularity did not sustain the astronomical circulation numbers that it originally posted. Nor could this have been expected. In many ways, these figures established unrealistic expectations for the periodical. It may have wanted to compete with the other popular magazines of the time, and it may not have achieved that goal completely, but it remained a respectable publication throughout its existence, and its own values never seemed to have been completely forfeited in favor of popular interests. As scholars, we cannot get too preoccupied with the Cornhill's steep decline, as fascinating as it is, because this undermines the Cornhill's enduring popularity. It is, in many ways, haunted by its own success, and this should not take away from the enduring and prolonged influence that it held in the Victorian periodical scene. Thanks for listening.